The new nature does not function according to the old fallen Adamic sinful nature. And so an infant can still operate like a person that's not saved and doesn't have the power in their life unless they grow. Look at somebody say it is imperative that we all grow. John chapter 2 verse 15 love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world and the world passes away and the lust thereof but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. Now pray with me. Father, I want to thank you for the word of God. We need you to amplify it. We need you, Lord God, to make it plain and clear and simple to us. We want to abide by your truths. Lord God, we thank you. We know with the help of God we can do all things. And therefore, Lord, we solicit your help, your mercy, your grace. Let your word find, uh, provide cleansing for us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Before I go right into the word, I want to thank the Lord for a young man that we hadn't seen in a while. Uh, Nicholas DiMartini. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. So good to see you. Amen. So good to see you. God bless all of you. Now, I want you to listen carefully to this word. The Lord has been dealing with me about this passage and a couple of other passages. Just, uh, just uh, he wanted to just open it up. Just literally uh, open it up so that we can hear. And I want to talk briefly about separation from the world. Yeah. Say that with me. Separation from the world. And Paul, the, the apostles talk like that. They, are talk, they talk, taught that in the early church they believed in it and they uh operated in that manner and they had a lot to say to the body of christ about uh their pilgrimage here down on earth in earth realm he said ye are strangers and pilgrims and sojourners he spoke to them like they were to understand that you are just passing through. And this must be our understanding and our attitude concerning this world. We are not here to stay. We cannot take anything with us when we leave. So we must not get attached to anything. Everybody still with me? All right. So. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. I remember preaching this one time at a, in a city, and there was a minister there. He got slightly offended. But um, as a minister, that's, what we, that's a part of what we preach, right? Uh, this is what Jesus did, and that's what his disciples or apostles did, taught so that the body of Christ would be separate from the world. And now, some may say, well, what do you mean world? And because the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Yeah. Well, the world in that sense, he was speaking concerning the inhabitants, the people that live in the world. God so loved humanity, right? That he gave his only begotten son. You know that he wouldn't give his only begotten son for a church or a building, right? 
or for material things. He gave his son for the sins of humanity. And so the, in that sense, the Bible says God so loved the world, the inhabitants of the world, that he gave his son to die for the, the, the people of the world. And so the world in this sense is speaking of that this world system that's under the sway and the power of Satan and influence of Satan. So this is what he's speaking of here. Now let's look at it a little closer. 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And then he makes a profound statement. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He makes another profound statement. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. When we or as we see ourselves and understand that we are children of God's kingdom, right? Yeah. Then we, being subjects of his kingdom, want to align ourselves with what's important to God. Because we have been born of God. We are children of God, seeing that we are children of God... We are to grow into mature to become more like him. So we are to develop in this image of who God is and what he's like. So the Bible, this was God's intended beginning. In the beginning, the Bible says, and God, after he made... Uh, everything on the earth and that was good he said he said let us make man in our image after our likeness so this is God's intent this is his original design and of course you know the story of sin and uh, how Satan came in of course the prince of this world to keep man from remaining in that state so now John says First, he, in beginning, uh, introduces himself as one that was an eyewitness of the word of God. Or he handled, he looked upon, he touched, he scrutinized the word of life. So that he concluded that this is indeed God's son, the word of God. And he shares with them about the fellowship that he had and the other apostles had with Jesus Christ and with the Father. And he shared with them, I want your joy to be full, he says. I want your joy to be complete. I want you to have fellowship with us. I want you to have partnership. And so uh, as he sharing with them these things... He shared certain things. He said, there's a message that we heard from the beginning. And this is what I'm declaring to you now. And that message is this. God is light. And in him, there's no darkness at all. And he stated the uh, qualifications for a person that wants to fellowship with this light. And you know it, you can read it on your own time. Chapter 1 is there. And he goes on even in part of chapter 2. And John is pretty, pretty, pretty uh, uh, blunt. He, there's no gray areas when he's speaking. He says there's light and there's darkness, right? He said there's love and there's hate. That's how he speaks, right? And uh, so there's unrighteousness and there's sin. So he was pretty blunt. And um, so I want to go back now to this passage here that he seemed like 
as he was sharing about loving the brethren and, and uh, writing to the fathers and the young men, uh, you know, writing to them and the children, the babes. And he just seemingly, it just stops. And it seems almost like it's right out of, not in context, but he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father. Now let's kind of look a little bit in, at each one of these. Three different kind of attitudes he projects. And the interesting thing is, 17b says, um, I'm 16, the latter part of 16 says, after he mentioned the pride of life, he said, is not of the Father, but is of the world. In other words, it finds its source of origin. Not from God. Are you with me? So now that makes us want to really want to know more about then seeing that uh, the lust of the flesh and the eyes and the pride of life comes from a different source. It doesn't come from God. And since it doesn't come from God, we want to be mindful of uh, what he's saying, how we respond, and, and how we entertain and embrace the different attitudes. Right? Because we don't want the, our attitudes to be coming from a, a, a source other than God. It can come from ourselves or come from flesh or the devil. So uh, and here's what he says now. Um, um, the lust of the flesh, all that's in the world, first the lust of the flesh. The writer says, the lust of the flesh means the impulsive desires that originates in the sinful uh, human nature. The impulsive desire that originates in the sinful human nature and results in sensuality and other illicit cravings, cravings, desires that comes from the old sinful nature and becomes improper. And most of the times those desires are in contradiction to the will of God. Did you get that? All right, we'll, we'll give some examples. But first he said there's the lust of the flesh. And remember in the garden when God was speaking to, he spoke to Adam and told him not to eat of the forbidden fruit. And the Bible says, and I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 3. After Satan tempted Eve, and she did eat, or he tempted her, caused her to take a second look. And verse 6 says, chapter 3, And when the woman saw, this is her eyes, sight, right? That the tree was first good for what? Food. She wasn't hungry. Right? She could have been hungry, and even if she was hungry, she wasn't to satisfy with that fruit. Are you with me? Because that was forbidden fruit. But when she looked upon it, she saw that it was good for food. That appealed to her flesh, right? All right. So, he said, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Remember when Jesus was in the garden or in the wilderness being tempted of the devil? Uh, the devil came back to him and says, if you be the son of God, right? Command this stone that it be made food or bread. Had Jesus yield it to him no matter what no matter what no telling what would have taken place right but 
these cravings and desires, he's speaking of that which is normally interferes with the will of God. Are you with me? So it was not the will of God that Jesus obeyed Satan nor command stones to be made food. But yet Satan was tempting him with it, right? And so Jesus, of course, he began to speak the word, said it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. It tells me now that uh, in order to overcome the desires of the flesh, it is important to have and know the word, right? I'm not getting too many witnesses here. The word of God is that which will keep us safe from yielding to the desires of this flesh. You uh, are like, and I was thinking about that, there is a lot of fleshly desires that we have. Now, I want you to turn with me to Ephesians. I really want you to follow me. I feel like the Holy Spirit is really, really uh, trying to get a message across to us as a body and the people of God. Ephesians chapter 2. When you're there, say amen. All right. The writer of Hebrews, I mean Ephesians, Paul, starts out in chapter 2, says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Spiritual death. Somebody say spiritual death. Now, and then he, he describes the behavior of a person or people that are spiritually dead. He says, we're in. Time past, you walk according to the course of this world, right? Then he further says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So Satan was behind. He was the one influencing those cravings and those desires. He was the invisible foe that still works in people's lives today. Primarily people that are unsaved. Now that's not all. I said primarily. He works in people that are saved as well. How does he work? Well, you got to think in terms of this is why God wants spiritual growth. The difference in a person that is uh, more spiritual and the one that's a babe, it has to do with their having grown to discern good and evil. A babe cannot discern evil properly. And so if a babe cannot discern evil properly, the babe is going to be babe and he's going to act like a babe, right? And uh, so uh, what, what, what is so important for us is it's like God says, I want my people to get in my word and become students of the word so that they can uh, have that word in them and not sin against me and have a change of mind. See things from God's point of view. And understand that we're God's people in, in his kingdom. And since you're kingdom people, he wants us to have the mind of people of the kingdom. And uh, that means what we do during the day will drastically change once we have kingdom mindsets. All right. That's something we think about. So he says, uh, here Paul is making it clear that there is an evil force that influences the behavior and the attitudes of the people of disobedience or the people that are not saved. That's probably a better way to put it. And um, 
So he also, to the babe, can influence the babe. What are you saying? The Lord wants, one of the reasons God wants us to grow and understand what's good and what's evil, a lot of times there are attitudes that we can have for years and never change them. But there are attitudes that pleases Satan and the flesh and not God. And it's these constant attitudes that prevail in even baby Christians' lives that They'll not get to know what's fully acceptable to God until they get into the word and begin to see from God's perspective and get insight into what's good and wholesome in the sight of God. So that means they will remain on the plane of spiritual infants. Well, you saying, what do you mean, Brother Herring? If I'm... Struggling with attitudes. I don't want anybody to say anything to me. If they say something wrong against me, I get an attitude. I don't want to speak to them anymore. Those are, those are characteristics of an infant. And God wants us to grow to the point where we can become long-suffering with one another. A person may be able to say bad things about you, but he doesn't want us to get bent out of shape because somebody says or acts bad against us for the purpose that we were called, that we would show forth the light of God. Having a new nature. The new nature does not function according to the old fallen, Adamic, sinful nature. And so an infant can still operate like a person that's not saved and doesn't have the power in their life unless they grow. Look at somebody say, it is imperative that we all grow. And so you can measure your growth by how you respond to when people treat you wrong. If I'm still acting the same way I did 10 years ago when people treat me wrong, I, I don't talk to them, I shut them out of my life, then that means I'm an infant. I may, I may have a whole lot of word in my head, but I'm still an infant because I have not learned to apply that which I have. It. Oh, y'all got to hear what I'm saying. And so what God is calling for us now is to grow to the point where the word becomes a part of our lives. It gets hidden into our hearts so that we will not sin against him. And when the word of God comes into us, there's a grace that comes with the word. There's a grace that will cause you not to respond in a certain way because the word of God is in you. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against him. David, the, uh, the Bible also says um, that great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them so that means I must now uh, have a new diet of the word of God um, and the more of the intake of the word of God um, I have the less I'm going to be offended when things don't go my way I are you hearing what I'm saying <laughs> but we are not called that things go our way that's not what we're called to. We're called to be lights. We are called to sonships. And I believe what God was saying as he was looking at this word, I'm saying, oh my God. God is saying, God says, I'm coming soon now. And I want the fruit from my people. Hallelujah. See, it's fruit that God is after. God is not after us playing church every, every week. Isn't that right? God is after fruit. So when I leave and when you leave this place, uh, if somebody steps on your toe wrong, if somebody turn, roll their eyes at you, then you're not going to roll your eyes at them or you're not going to go and tell your neighbor about how they acted and how they treated you. You're going to just shrug it all off and say, well, that's just where they are. I forgive them, Lord, and keep right on going. Isn't that right? We're talking about growth and maturity. Isn't that right? So it's like we are lights. People need to know how to respond. People need to know how to respond. But unless we grow to the point where we can understand what's proper in the sight of God, we will still have the infant mentality. I ain't going to they ain't gonna treat me that way. You're not going to treat me that way. Then that's infantile. Hallelujah. 
that the Lord is calling us to a higher standard in the word of God and that's why Paul said I want you to uh, uh, have the full knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You said, what do you mean, Paul? And I was talking to the Lord, and he was sharing with me about this. And then he said, okay, go to Ephesians 4. So I go to Ephesians 4. Then he said, brethren, I want you to walk with all, uh, 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 according to the vocation, that where you're called with all lowliness, yeah. meekness, yeah. long-suffering. Endeavoring to keep unity in the body. Do you not know that if I go to church and I've got ought against somebody, it's going to affect somebody else. It's going to affect somebody else because I have ought against somebody. But the wonderful altar is here for us to get it right. Isn't that right? Ah, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Every Sunday, it's like God says, here's my altar. Come on to my altar. Make those confessions and turn. No, no, don't keep going the same way, but turn, right? That's true forgiveness. Forgiveness is to turn away from it and make a decision to go another way. That's forgiveness. But if, uh, and we said that some other, uh, a few Sundays ago. But if I, if I repent and keep going the same way, I haven't repented, right? Because repentance is not complete unless I turn and make a decision to do it differently. That's true repentance. So when that happens, now God says, okay, you're ready for more. I'm going to give you more now. I'm going to give you a little bit more meat now. <laughs> because you're applying what you hear. You're applying what you know. And uh, so, so, so he said the word, uh, all this in the world, Lust of the flesh. Then he said, the lust of the eyes. Lust of the eyes. What are you talking about? Uh, the writer says, the lust of the eyes is the greedy cravings that wants whatever it sees. The greedy cravings that want whatever it sees. Have you ever noticed that when you get, uh, 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 let's say you get a couple, of, uh, you get this stimulus check, $1,400. And you're excited. Now, it's $1,400 more than you had. But for some reason, you figure that thing down. You say, boy, if I had another $500. I saw your case.